dear and esteemed participants, thank you for being with us for this 30th Global Digital Encounter. This project that started very long ago, now, just during the pandemics, aims at discussing how we can construct, deconstruct, reconstruct, improve the current IP system. What is to be done? What is to be done facing the challenges that we are uh, meeting all time? In this very moment, as uh, co-directors of the uh, Global Digital Encounter Projects, Professor De Santes and myself, and as coordinator, Javier Fernandez Laschetti, we thought that it was time, it was timely, to discuss the IP implications of the data economy. The data economy is considerably changing the way the IP system can, must function. This is something that is that has become uh, quite evident, but how it will change in the future, what elasticity the IP system may have, what consequences may happen for trade between countries and also between companies, this is what we want to explore today. We thank again all our pro bono sponsors and pro bono speakers for this activity. We are uh, so grateful to have people connected from all over the planet and also people would, will then read the report that we will issue, watch this global digital encounter and be in touch with us. Participants are reminded that uh, very soon they will be able also to raise questions to the moderator and to the speakers in this very chat, in the chat of uh, uh, this connection. We have with us exceptional speakers. We have exceptional speakers from all over the world. We have our colleague uh, Nicolas Searle from uh, London, from London Little University, who is with us today. And uh, we have also two academics and professionals from uh, Eastern and Southeastern Asia. Professor Samuel, who is with us, Samuel Lee, who is with us, connected from uh, Seoul in South Korea. So very late in the night for him. We thank him very much for this. And we shall have as moderator, Professor Caroline Berube from Singapore, Singapore and Canada, but currently in Singapore, who is also an uh, academic at Bocconi, and we will be the moderator of this very session. So we uh, thank you very much for your time. We thank very much all participants for being with us. And at this very stage, we, uh, I give the floor to my colleague, coordinator of the Global Digital Encounters, Javier Fernandez Laschetti, who uh, sh we shall also give a word of introduction. We really think that this is a super important GDE, and this is uh, one, this will be for sure one of the best. I declare open the GDE. Javier, the floor is yours. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Laurent. And yes, indeed, this is one of uh, uh, our uh, GDs uh, most important because uh, uh, because the economy of data is uh, not the future but is the present. Uh, everything's about data currently. Uh, you know that I feel very European, so I had to remind that uh, in 2015 the European Union fostered the creation of a data economy, has done the homework, I believe, and uh, this is a reality currently. So, and we will see many, many improvements and many uh, evolution of this data economy in the future. And of course, the IP is in the core of uh, this uh, data economy in many aspects or facets. So that's why we have here uh, one moderator and two speakers uh, that are specialists in the field and will illustrate us about uh, these issues. So I'm very, very happy to be here and to hear from, from them their thoughts and, and, and feelings about so the present and the future. And uh, remember that you belong to a community. Please uh, raise your hand. Please uh, send us uh, comments, etc. because we all belong to this community. And uh, now uh, the floor is uh, yours, Caroline. Thank you. Thank Caroline. you so much, uh, Professor Monderieu and uh, Ravi for the great introduction and for setting the table uh, for this important topic. Um, and I'm really happy about today because we have lawyers, but we also have Nicola, who is 
not a lawyer. So I think it's going to bring a um, very interesting flavor to our session today. And because like, you know, for a long time, like, you know, a lot of people thought like, you know, like um, data and digital economy were like part of law, et cetera. And then for some time, like it was part of telecommunication, media and te technology from a legal perspective. And I'm sure Samuel will agree because I think in, in, in Korea and I know some of his colleagues are very involved with that practice, which is called TMT. Um, so it's a very established practice uh, which involves um, data and digital economy. But there's been a very growing recognition that the field of data and digital economy now requires its own complex set of and skill um, uh, uh, professional to deal with that because it's no longer involving lawyers, but involve a full range of people because it involves different competency required. Um, and just in terms of why it's such an important topic, I was looking at statistic and it says now that um, the int intelligible, intangible assets make up for 21 US trillion dollar of the five the, of a, the S and P 500 companies. So it's a huge part of the economy. You know, like we cannot avoid it, we cannot ignore it. We definitely have to discuss it, and um, that's why it's going to be interesting to discuss about. Um, this perspective from a cross-border transaction, so we are all in different con country and continent, in fact, but also like looking at it from different perspectives. Um, so one of the first questions we wanted to address, uh, it's how can intellectual property enhance innovation within the digital economy? Samuel, would you like to take it? You're on mute. Uh you're muted, Samuel. We can't. We can't hear you. Apologies. Uh, can no you problem. hear me now? Perfectly. Thank you. Oh yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm the patent attorney in the room, so uh, uh, my approach to this will be um, from the point of view of of helping clients who come to us uh, uh, to to make them uh, uh, much more. Um, attractive in terms of, of, of uh, investments, as well as preparing them to go public. So um, at the end of the day, uh, if someone has a wonderful idea, uh, be it in the data economy or otherwise, uh, the most important aspect of what they need to prepare for when they go in for the series A, B, or C uh, uh, funding is to, is to have some answer to uh that's a wonderful idea but how do you protect someone from uh, a, another company copying your idea or your product or or your particular database or or how you keep your your information and and at the end of the day um um you need to answer that question in a way that makes the investor uh, or even when you uh, go public, uh, the public uh, that's willing to buy your stock, comfortable with that answer, right? So um, in essence, um, without proper IP protection, it's very difficult uh, uh, to, to obtain that, that, that investment, um, as well as uh, uh, be successful uh, once you go public. Um, uh, and, and in essence, I, I, I have to warn you, your, uh, the laws um, right now in the United States and Korea and elsewhere are still behind the times. <laughs> uh, 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 um, there are certain litigations right now where where certain individuals individuals are trying to get patents for uh, AI generated inventions, right? And uh, those litigations are working through. Um, in the United States, I, I believe uh, there was a decision that said no. In Korea, uh, uh, there was a recent decision that said no, right? But um, uh, but that's based on the current framework of laws, uh, which in, in, in the IP realm include patents, uh, trademark, design, copyright, and uh, unfair competition, right? So, so at, and then of course, trade secrets. Um, uh, uh, so uh, many companies uh, in the digital space are choosing uh, to, to keep things uh, as a trade secret. In other words, a black box. And, um, 
And as a result, um, you, you are not having other com uh, other competitors sort of building on top of what they did, other than by certain performance criteria, uh, which which you have seen in terms of the generative AI uh, models that are out there, right? So, so um, that's sort of um, a, a sort of an overview from a patent attorney's point of view. <laughs> Of, of why IP is so important for the digital economy. All right, it helps with the funding, it helps with uh, the investments and, and the competition. Hey, thank you, Sam. Um, one thing that I would like to add, and probably Nicola will want to add something at this topic. So registration of all IP is always crucial from my perspective, as you said, to increase value of your company and, and your asset. And I feel one thing that I, our clients realize a lot of, of, of companies have data, which is worth a lot of money and is also at risk, right? Because especially now with all the cross-border transaction, data can flow from one country to another one. And as I'm most of the time based between China and Singapore, like for example, China has a new like um, data protection law because China is very protective about data that are collected in China. So let's say you do have a company, which is a Swiss company, which have an entity in China, and they have they collect data from their clients or their supplier in China. And then you want to acquire the company in Switzerland and the company in China. If there's a breach of data protection and all their database in China, you can be liable for a lot of money. So if I'm going to be the buyer of that company and I'm not in compliance with not only like all the IP law, but also now we put a lot in the big, the same basket, like all the GDPR or like the GDPR Chinese version, for example, or Singapore version and other countries in the same basket. So very important that these two aspects are really well covered um, by companies. And, and I guess, Nicola, like it's a good segue for you to add your comments on this <laughs> question from, from a business um, and academic perspective. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I should apologize profoundly for not being a lawyer. So uh, please accept that for my apology. <laughs> no, no, um, no. more perfect than us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll try to take it a bit more macro because um, when we think about, you know, why do we need intellectual property and innovation? The classic economic side is we need incentives for companies to uh, to uh, innovate. And that's what, you know, Caroline and Samuel have just talked about in terms of firm strategies. Absolutely the case. Firms need to be able to protect their innovation and they need to be able to have those discussions about liability and raising funds, et cetera. The other side of this is sort of thinking about on a macro side is we also need that innovation and that knowledge to become public again. And that, when we talk about data, is a trickier discussion, which I think we'll probably start talking a bit more about some of those aspects later on. So we have this, um, you know, really exciting emerging economy. So, I mean, data and digital economy has been around for a while, but there are still so many areas of growth, a lot of contested territory. And so intellectual property is great for incentivizing innovation in that area, but we also don't want it to sort of get completely, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word colonized, um, which has sort of other connotations too, but we, we need that kind of balance. So there is the idea, and absolutely, we need to be rewarding firms for their innovations, but there also needs to be room for future innovation, which is why when we talk about intellectual property from an economics perspective, it is meant to eventually expire. Samuel mentioned trade secrets, which is an interesting one. It's my favorite. <laughs> but yeah, when we get, to, it is my favorite. Are we allowed to have favorite IPs? It's my favorite. Um, uh, so it, it it's going to be, um, so it, absolutely the patents in this space, the investments that need to happen, the ability for companies to know that they've got something that they're buying. Intellectual property is absolutely um, important to, and fundamental to all of those. I'm, just, I'm being slightly not, I don't think it's quite devil's advocate. I'm, just adding the fact that we do need to think about how this knowledge will be used 10, 20 years from now, and that it needs to be more freely open at the same time. So balance that. But uh, uh, with that, uh, what Nicola was saying, uh, I, 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 I just wanted to add a lot of this important data is held by large companies and it's not public <laughs> All right, at some point in time. And, and I, I think the antitrust authorities within each country are starting to look into this, right? And um, at the end of the day, the Googles, the Amazons, uh, Apple, for example, 
they keep a lot of data and they use that data for their own purposes, right? So uh, uh, I, I think there that question needs to be asked. I mean, does that data or, or should that data be accessible by the public? And if so, in which form? Because you also have data privacy issues, as, yeah. as Carolyn pointed out, and uh, certain countries are requiring their their national, I'm, I'm sorry, their uh, citizens' data to stay within their national boundaries. Uh, uh, India is one, China is another. <laughs> so, so in essence, I mean, how much anonymization of that data needs to be done to be able to freely allow uh, sharing of that data? And, and I think that's a question that I think uh, the, the, the uh, governments as well as uh, the, the major companies need, need to a uh, answer at some point in time. Yeah, and I, I was looking at a few definition of digital economy before session yesterday <laughs> and today, and, <laughs> and you know, like I was just trying to see different perspective from the legal to the economical to like finance people. And there's a few that are like, one was like from, well, one of the founder of the term digital economy, Don Tapscott, who said like, um, it's a new economy, almost the fourth industrial revolution, and it's information in all its form that becomes digital, reduced to bits stored in computer and racing at the speed of flight across network. Which, you know, like, which brings the point that, you know, like, how, like, you know, big companies have their data, but you know, like how first, how can they really protect them? And how it's not, it's so easy to transfer, transfer them from one country to another country. And can we do that, right? Because it's not like, you know, it's intangible. And so what are the rules about this? And should we have, a, a, should, should we have many government that work together and collaborate? For example, I think about the ASEAN um, integration digital uh, framework, for example. So there's 11 countries working together to make sure it is consistent within these 11 countries. But you know, like it's only 11 countries. What do we do with the rest of the world? It's like the data will not stay only in the 11 countries. Um, it, it's so easy. It's like, you know, like I have a phone and I transfer my phone to send it to Nicola by DHL. It's like <laughs> data can be, it's like, you know, I like the expression, it's racing at the speed of flight across network. And I think it couldn't be defined in a better way. Yeah, uh, and so that that's in its base base form, right? But really, the digital economy also includes a metaverse, right? <laughs> right, uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 digital uh, um, um, uh, 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 things such as NFTs that people are putting value on, right? Uh, that really, you can't see it, right? <laughs> And, and as a result, companies have to prepare uh, to protect their 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 trademarks, for example, uh, um, for this digital economy and and how users are gonna uh, view their trademarks, for example, right? And uh, uh, in fact, certain uh, trademarks are now being registered in different classes now. Well, actually, that's probably the second question, but 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 in essence, that. That that digital economy now is 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 sort of expanding in, into realms that are user friendly versus uh, business B two B. All right, um, a lot of businesses now are are trading some of that data, and 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 you're assuming that that data was recorded in a way that it's 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 stored in a way that is easily transferable, but that's not always the case. And and we're finding that out in Korea, for example, in the healthcare information. Uh, um, one of the the major resources in Korea right now is the healthcare information that each hospital group is keeping, and that information is not easily transportable and exchangeable because it, it was originally stored in a different form and and in different order. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, so that's also something that you sort of need to worry about in these databases. Yeah, and I guess like to push it even further, like, you know, like now so many patients are getting like, you know, let's say I have, I'm, I'm in Korea, I'm going to the hospital there, but I want to transfer my file to the US or to right. Canada. Like right. now, like, you know, there's so many rules about this. My mom was sick about 
2016 and she left Singapore with a file, like a hard copy file. We're not talking about a generation ago. We're talking about <laughs> six, seven years ago. You know, now it can be wow. transferred like from one country to another one. But the hospital in Canada didn't want to receive the hard copy because it thought like it was data privacy issues. Uh, but now, like, you know, how do we, if it's for the benefit of the client, mm -hmm. you know, like my mom, that's what she wanted, right? But then like there's so much legal system or rules around that like doesn't allow sometimes company to receive it. So if I could um, uh, tap on that, um, uh, touch it on that point. So one of the things that um, sometimes is at odds with intellectual property, but it is something that we're talking about a lot in management and economics is the idea of open innovation. And a subset of that is open data. And I'm sure, you know, all of your clients will be practicing open innovation by already because they're doing licensing and collaborating and joint ventures in its various forms. Open data is a slightly different challenge because it tracking who owns what and Caroline, the privacy issues just you've just remember um, mentioned Samuel, the points you just said on jurisdictional issues. So these these it's um some there's been some recent work saying basically there's a lot of value being left on the table here because we can't quite figure out how to figure quite comfort who owns what and who gets to own what comes I out agree. of this open data. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 when you want to create something uh, that is open data. Uh, it's got to be in the right format, number one. Uh, number two, you you need some standards, right? Uh, uh, at the end of the day, you don't know how biased that data is, right? Because, uh, 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 and, and there's no entity that, that reviews that data to, to test that data for, for, for whether it is unbiased, for example, or whether it's accurate, right? And, uh, Right now, uh, data is being generated, and it's it's there's no standard uh, for that data. Yeah, and I guess like you know, it brings to one question that we had discussed together about how should IP rights be protected, right, to enhance enforcement in the digital economy. And I guess it's not only like you know one entity or one part of the government that has to deal with it. It has to be done in a cohesion way. Um, yeah. Yeah. For example, in Singapore, like, you know, like ACRA and IPOS, one is for the company and the other one is for the IP. Like, you know, they're working together to do a joint framework. Um, so this is one of the initiatives, for example, yeah. that they were working on. Uh, but then like this is, again, we're talking about Singapore, which is a small island with six million people. Right now, if we talk about data across the world and how do we. Um, so it would be interesting. How, how, how do you deal with that, Nicola and, and Samuel? No, please, please take this. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. All right. So, so I, uh, all I can tell you right now is, the, in terms of the laws, it's behind the times. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm a U.S. licensed attorney, so I can tell you about the U.S. The U.S. law, especially, is behind the times in terms of data protection, uh, in terms of privacy. Uh, certain states within the United States have separate privacy laws, all right, that are stronger than the than the national standard, uh, but but generally the U.S. has been behind. Um, Korea is just uh, um, it, is a little bit better in terms of data privacy. It's it's one of the most onerous you know data privacy countries in the world, and the Korean Personal Information Protection Act is uh, on the level of GDPR or even worse because the definitions aren't very good. <laughs> Right. So so <laughs> that's generating a lot of work for the law firms. And, and finally, uh, in Korea, um, the Copyright Act, the Korean Copyright Act has a database protection portion in it. Right. Um, uh, unfortunately, the protection isn't very long. It's like five years. But if there's significant effort to renew that database and to update it, then it's another five years. Right. So. But but the Korean uh, uh, copyright it includes that. Now, I haven't looked at other uh, countries' laws, but in essence, all the other countries are reevaluating, from my understanding, especially the EU, uh, their laws uh, to 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 come you know up to speed. Uh, but um, because of the sheer speed in which uh, the digital economy has is changing. Especially after uh, generative AI has made such a huge hit, 
that uh, uh, the laws and 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 the reaction uh, the uh, the governments are being reactive with the laws right now. They're they're playing catch up. And I guess like even if you have the best law, and that's what we encounter in China, like the, all the data protection are like law are pretty new, like eighteen months old. Uh, but now it's like, how are they going to be enforced? By the time, like you know, like even exactly. if you look at court <laughs> case right now, there's very few exactly. court cases in China on this. You know, like it's so like the client contacted us and I said, well, you know, like we have this, this, this potential risk with the new law. And even if I will, I want to tell them, well, that's how it's going to be. The, the court or the government will look at it. You know, like there's very, very few cases. So the law are kind of there, but the enforcement is very, very new, and we don't know in which direction the government will go. Or the court, and once they go towards that, like you know, probably the law will be will have to be amended again because, as you both said, like the digital economy is moving at such a fast pace, especially like post COVID. Yes. You know, like I was yeah. like post COVID, like you know, so many things were disrupted. Like you know, the e-commerce, all the subscription, all the docu, the um, e-signature. You know, these are three industries, for example, that have been changing at a rapid pace because of COVID, and probably would have, it would have not been so fast without COVID, but we, the companies were forced to be innovative to carry on business. That I agree, that I agree. So, so um, 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 there's one thing that I think uh, um, everything may be, everyone may be interested in is that uh, uh, the, in the trademark space, um, there have been certain classes that have been modified to include virtual uh, goods. So. The way trademarks works is you, you you file a trademark application and then you have to identify the good that it applies to. So, for example, uh, uh, Louis Vuitton handbags, right? <laughs> you have the LV and then you have to uh, identify the class of goods. Now, so um, the cl trademark classes have been updated to include virtual goods, right? So um, there was a recent litigation uh, filed by... Uh, second i think i i want to say gucci but shoot yeah it's one of the the famous uh, uh um uh, oh no it was Hermes. i apologize yeah 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 and and um there was an nft of an Hermes bag that was sold <laughs> and and thankfully Hermes had already and then it was like called the meta birkin or something like that right so <laughs> And the Hermes, thankfully, um, had 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 uh, updated their trademark registration to include virtual goods, and those include, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll just name the class numbers. But class number nine, thirty-five, thirty-eight, uh, thirty-six, and forty-one, in ca in case they're they're blockchain also involved, right? So. But anyways, I, I just want everyone to know the trademark uh, um, classifications have been upgraded to include virtual transactions and virtual goods. Oh, can I make a quick comment on NFTs. Um, I'm very glad that that bubble burst, although I feel sorry for people who did not come out so financially well out of it. Um, I, I mean, it, I could go on about the bad things I thought about the whole thing from day one. Um, but, uh, and it, but it clearly posed a big problem for trademarks, uh, trademark owners yes. and brands. So it's yes. been interesting to see that I think the market sort of self-corrected in some ways. Um, that, I mean, that is one slightly more positive way of looking at it than... Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if we have other areas as the digital economy and the data develops, you know, will we start to have other sort of bubbles, maybe an AI generated content. And of course, we're going to have a lot of um, IP issues with some of those. So I'm, I'm interested to see uh, what happens next and what they're um, it, the NFT one was um, it was a, such an interesting combination of IP of creativity of consumers of not art, understanding yes. at yes. all what they were buying um, arts and there were there were a lot of opportunities that unf unfortunately I think have have died with the market um, well, but yeah it's well, for the for the brands for, unfortunately yeah unfortunately it was a combination of, of buyers who didn't understand what they were getting and sellers who are not completely uh, honest <laughs> about what the, what they were selling, right? And and these rights were were basically written in the attached contracts to these NFTs, 
and those contracts were not uh, <laughs> were using language that wasn't exact. Uh, to yeah, it, is the best way I could say it <laughs> in a nice way, right? But um, I, I must say that bubble has burst, and that bubble has burst because the metaverse has not taken off as fast and as greatly as everyone was thinking it would. Um, um, uh, everyone sort of envisioned, you know, a continuation of COVID. Everyone would, would go, you know, online and 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 live in their virtual worlds instead of yeah. experiencing life. <laughs> and, yeah, I guess now people have this time way. to go virtual. They want to experience life, and everybody's back to the old fast space <laughs> exactly. living. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when when the metaverse becomes as developed as uh, the internet is right now, what you do on the internet, you're going to do in the metaverse. All right, be it a search, be it designing things, be it you know meeting people, or even financial transactions. Right. So, so literally, you're going to be like you know, uh, for example, going to a, a virtual ATM and and, and taking out money. <laughs> Because in essence, I mean, all money is going to turn into digital currency anyways, eventually. But but, but at the end of the day, <laughs> all, all the major banks are doing that, too, right now. <laughs> so so but but at the end of the day, the metaverse didn't take off. And that's why I think the NFT uh, bubble bursts. But when when it does take off and, and everyone's going to be polishing off their NFTs that they bought and trying to figure out you know, uh, what rights they, they really do have, right? So so they can build their virtual uh, homes and, and hang up their virtual paintings and carry their virtual, you know, Birkin bags and whatever have you. <laughs> yeah, what a world. I'm glad that it's changing and it bursts in some ways. Though AI has picked up, I think, in the meantime, which I think leads me to one question I wanted to us to discuss about what are the issues and opportunities does AI play in relation to an existing IP framework and that mm. digital economy? I know, for example, like source code and AI algorithm, uh, they can be protected by copyright, you know, but how, how Nicola or Sam, you see it in your field? I'm sorry, Nicola, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> sure. So, so um, my second favorite IP right is uh, copyright. Um, I, or I probably shouldn't pick favorites. Anyway, so um, <laughs> I've been thinking, you know, <laughs> everyone should have their favorite. So um, where you know, with copyright and when we talk about the creative industries, because a lot of the AI, I mean, it's text based or image based at the moment. So we are talking about creations and creative content. It, we look back to the 20 years ago or 25 time flies, the sort of the advent of the digital economy and what's happened through that, how that's evolved. And so we had the immediate, you know, I'm just thinking about sort of the music industry. We had that Napster, Wild West. You had no idea who was consuming what. There was a lot of infringement. Then we moved to kind of the iTunes and then we got Spotify and now we've got sort of we're not quite sure what happens next because there's, there's still tensions. Um, TikTok is doing well in terms of music. So we've had that evolution. And I think we're kind of in the same spot now. We're in the AI Napster phase in that we have a lot of free content. I, I mean, what, you know, we're not consumers aren't paying for these services. We're clearly going to see more advanced tools and you know, the sort of equivalent of iTunes is going to be around the corner. I mean, not you know, in terms of the sort of the fact that there will be financially viable and um, valuable services for, uh, for consumers. And this is you know, some of this extends to B2B, obviously. So we've got this kind of point where we don't really know what we're dealing with yet. Um, but there are a lot of the copyright questions are already coming out, right? You know, who owns it? Who should be paying for it? Who owns what goes in? Who owns what goes out? Um, you know, who's liable? These are all the the um, the uh, big questions that uh, the we, we, the lawyers have to gra grapple with. <laughs> I, get, I just get to pontificate whether, you know, whether this will have an economic um, impact. And it's, you know, what we're seeing right now is everyone, you know, struggling with this, all these jurisdictions trying to figure out there's several lawsuits going on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not as au fait on, on the, um, the dynamics there, but it, it's going to be interesting because, you know, 
iTunes, we had, sorry, Napster, we had Napster, but they had no money. Whereas now we're talking about um, AI owned by companies with a lot of money. So then we're sort of in a, is this a Google book situation, right? Could it be a Google book? Um, because that was, it was unclear. And I should say, I, I don't, I don't feel at this point we can really take sides and I because I there's it's so unclear what needs to happen or what should happen and what is fair so I think a lot of things happening in copyright the trade secret side of it um is, is also very interesting but I'll, I'll just stop with copyright okay so 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 for some background for those people who who, who don't understand the copyright question um um the AI engines with slight modifications are, are pretty much public and uh, and uh, uh, certain companies uh, uh, like uh, OpenAI or Google, or their AI engines are slightly different. But in essence, uh, these engines are basically uh, uh, modeled after language models. And, uh, and um, as a result, they try and predict the next word, for example, or, or the proper sequence of sentences, right? Uh, and and really what you do is you create this model and you teach it, you feed it all this information, right? And um, and with the computing power that, that you have, uh, you feed it uh, tons of books, tons of images, all that sort of stuff. And all those books and images are copyrighted material. <laughs> And, and the first question then becomes, when you train an AI model, uh, does using that information itself uh, infringe the copyright laws, right? Your copyright legal uh, rights that you have. And I, I think that's a question because is it really reading it? <laughs> right? Because the copyright right, uh, basket of rights that you have is the right to reproduce it. And, and which they do because otherwise they wouldn't be able to use it right okay and 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 the reason why it reproduce it uh uh perform it uh uh and there's like a couple of other rights but those are the major ones and and if you look think of it in terms of a book or or music and napster if you have a music mp3 file and you download it all right that you get a copy of it and you're enjoying that music right uh, when you're Using it in a in, in a AI model to to teach it, uh, uh, it's it's still I think a question. I mean, literally, I think it's infringement. All right, because uh, it, it infringes on basket rights, but it's not your traditional infringement that that you think about, right? <laughs> like listening to music or rereading a book or or whatever have you, right? So so um, those litigations actually are uh, um, are 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 currently be uh, in in the works uh, so there have been litigations on copyright infringement filed against open ai for example uh uh certain other companies like google and uh and these are copyright owners of books and music and images right so so um those answers i think are still uh have i'm, I'm sorry those questions uh, still have not been answered right now and uh, it's it's making its way through the courts, uh, and, and they're and they're valid, you know, questions, right? Um, if you're going to use data that's out there without any, you know, ramifications whatsoever, I mean, th that should not be fair, right? <laughs> sort of like you know, um, how Google does their news service now. Um, they used to uh, uh, reproduce the entire article. Now they put in a link and to the title and and. Give the link to who the uh, uh, the new service is, right? So, and that only occurred because of the litigation, right? So, um, and 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 Nicola, I, I agree with you. Um, um, it, the the issues need to be worked through the courts uh, based on current laws and maybe future laws, uh, uh, depending on which country that you're talking about. Oh, so I guess I can only lead me to like the ne one of the next question we wanted to discuss, like if. Let's say like it's it's the copyright owner is in the US and there's an infringement of that copyright in because of the digital aspect of it, you know, like in, I don't know, Indonesia, Australia. So what does it mean that 
the the, com the individual and the company breaching the copyright has to go sue the court. And in which country is it where the infringing person was? Is it where the owner was? And how do you calculate the damage? You know, the practical question of doing it. It's such a fluid situation. That, that's become a huge problem. And I, I presume the analysis is going to follow uh, the analysis that was done on the internet or infringement on the internet. Um, and um, at the end of the day, uh, the question is where that data came from and, and, and who packaged the data and made it accessible, I think is, is what it's going to be. Yeah. I, I just love this idea of offshoring your, your copyright infringement, <laughs> just outsourcing <laughs> it. And, um, yeah, I mean, because that that doesn't, yeah, and I, I think some of what you've just said it, um, matches it. I mean, it would it'd be interesting also if, if this match, if if this dynamic also ends up with content creation being put in different countries for strategic reasons. Oh, derivative work. That could be interesting. Yes. Yeah. Let's see. So, uh, and uh, so people who don't understand what that is, a derivative work is basically um, a secondary work based on the primary work. And uh, an example would be the Andy Warhol sort of. Uh, funky picture, you know, paintings that Andy World. Those are all based on photographs that someone else took, <laughs> right? So Andy Warhol would be a derivative work of the original photograph. Uh, so that that's sort of an example of what a derivative work is. Yes. No, it's definitely challenging, right? To see how how it's going to be in five years. Even so, what we discussed right now, you know, and the thinking that we have. You know, we would do it in 12 months or in like three years time and our conclusion or oh. thought would probably be totally different um, so, because it's moving yeah, at such a fast pace. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, open open AI, for example, train their their uh, uh, what second generation. I think they're on the fourth generation, uh, the third generation in less than six months. <laughs> and the previous generation before that, it took like a year and a half to two, right? So uh, the computing power plus uh, algorithms that, that, that they're using are now, I mean, and things are changing so quickly. Um, um, the reason why Microsoft, for example, uh, invested so much money in OpenAI <laughs> is they wanted to use uh, the, the, uh, the algorithm for the Microsoft products. And, and I just read an article earlier today where uh, uh, the emails are now going to automatically be written for you when you write a couple of words. <laughs> well, it's sort like, of like what people use for chat GDP, right? Like some people you can exactly, write an essay exactly. just because yeah, yeah. see like five words and then like you just come with like um, a decent text. Exactly, and exactly. It, it's wait, sort of going to be like, Amazon, when you go on the website, it already knows what you want. <laughs> right. oh, just, and just, just like comment, um, I'm, uh, it's been great fun navigating this with students. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But I'm I thought sure. there was a tool or that's what my kids tell me, that there's a tool now that teachers can really know if you're like if if it's not you you can just basically like have a there's a software that exists so you can just take your text and tell the student well this was like you know like this was not the original text um is I that think, true or i think we should all believe there is a tool whether or not it actually exists <laughs> or make them believe <laughs> we can believe there's a tool and you know when, when turn it in which was the predecessor when that was when that first came around so that gives a play a, a very literal check against uh, existing um there were copyright dis disputes on that like because it was building on existing works so um yeah it'll be interesting anyway let, let's believe there's an ai tool that will tell us if it's been written yeah yeah, I forget the name of it. Um, there is a tool that that checks, but even that tool <coughs> isn't a hundred percent. It was so like totally eighty something percent. I will be telling my students it works. Yeah, and, and <laughs> yes, of in, course. In essence, I I think at the end of the day, the only way to really place it correctly is to get a writing sample from that student, uh, written in class. And you compare the writing styles is the only way you're going to be able to prevent cheating like that.
Yeah, I mean, I realize, sorry, this is, we are getting, I took a slightly um, off, but the, uh, yeah, this is, this discussion is happening across universities right now is how do we move from what was, uh, you know, and it, it goes to that sort of idea of plagiarism, like what it, what does it mean to be copying someone else's work? And we're all trying to figure out how do we now deal with this generated content? Where, where is the line between copying or is it? Anyway, we're all grappling with what the new, um, the new approach appropriate responses and guidelines will be for universities. Yeah, and the students are much are so smart these days. They just know how to oh, to do so it good. super. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we talk like, you know, about AI and we talk about different countries. And so do you think like you know, like each many countries want to own the concept of digital economy? But what are the challenges that could this pause? And also, do you believe that countries should work together? Do you think it, it's it's a job that should be done by governments together? You know, should be discussed at Davos, for example, where government, like a bit like what we do about climate change, for example, or other like important topic that government decide to work together either by region or like the banks work together. I was with a banker today and, and working in, in the UK and she was saying like, you know, like, a lot of banks, central banks now want to work together on climate change. So do you think, for example, like um, similar in a similar way, like, you know, we should have regulator across the world working together, together, working on this together or, you know, like banks or government or mm -hmm. the private sector? <laughs> Nicola, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I'm just... Um... I'm, I'm sort of thinking of the negative of that and that um, one of the things, so I work on trade secrets and one of the things that's happening in terms of that competition, um, what what, you know, what future do we want of a digital economy, of a data economy? What, what future do we do? And I don't know that there's any agreement at all of what that would look like. So I'd be I'd be curious to see if um, if governments could get to go together and come up with something that they all that enough people would agree on, um, but although I could see there's potential there for perhaps uh, privacy discussions or um, uh, compatibility standards, we have a lot of discussions on standard essential patents at the moment. Of course, there are things going SCPs. on there. Yeah, everybody that loves a good SCP, um, <laughs> third favorite. <laughs> Um, uh, so the um, but one of the things I have seen a lot of is that there is this increasing discussion in geopolitical tensions of IP of innovation. And so it strikes me that there's a lot of contested space in this area. So I think there are some areas where we could have much more cooperation. And I'm thinking on a government level. Um, but I, there are certainly areas I think we're really going to struggle to get um, to get cooperation. And yeah. You know, I'm just thinking, for example, like, you know, when there's a breach of, of IP, you know, in China, like the, the damage that can be obtained by the infringed company, like, or there's a, there's a maximum. It's not the norm, it's not the same in other countries. Um, so this is one small aspect of IP, for example, which is different from country to country. Um, but I guess, like, you know, it, it, it challenge it. Like, you know, I was mentioning a bit earlier about ASEAN, like, you know, like there's 11 countries together, Southeast Asia working together. I don't know how if you have something similar, including Korea, like, I don't know, with Japan and Taiwan and uh, or in Europe. Uh, um, I, I, yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, uh, at the government level, there's too much politics and history that gets in the way, <laughs> although. I think that would be the best, like a UN sort of, you know, body for data economy. I don't know, uh, but 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 um, I, I think uh, uh, when it comes to the data economy, it's gonna follow more in terms of uh, the standards bodies. I think in terms of industry, right? Uh, so if you look at uh, the wireless industry, for example. Uh, there's a standards bodies that 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 sets up, you know, what 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 4G is, what 5G is, and it's composed of industry players, right? Because they know the technology. So in essence, I mean, I I think, uh, for example, uh, for healthcare data, uh, if or even for consumer purchasing data, I I think the industries have to work together to create that those standards and um and, and and i think that would be much more efficient uh 
Um, although ideally, if we have some UN body that 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 regulates the data or sets up the data in a very neutral and unbiased way, I I think that would be great too. But uh, once again, I mean, there's just too much politics and history. Uh, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure Korea and Japan would not trade data, for example, <laughs> because of the history that's getting in the way. Uh, um, EU maybe as a block, maybe. Uh, I mean, they did that with GDPR, which I was utterly impressed by, right? And and uh, so so um, and and Korea followed suit, and other countries followed suit on that standard, right? So so in essence, I, I I'm hoping that that. The companies uh, uh, the, understand the the commercial benefits of of coming up with a certain you know data structure or whatever sets of data that can be used within that industry, be it healthcare, be it consumer, you know electronics, be it uh, purchasing trends or, or whatever have you. Uh, I think that would be pretty uh, much more efficient than the government generated. And and I can only point to the standard essential bodies that you see, you know, the IEEE's, you know, uh, um, the the wireless associations, uh, 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 and that's where all the SAP issues are being resolved, really. Mm -hmm. There are there is some third sector activity in in data, particularly so open date inst institutes, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know there that is. kind of uh -huh. thing. So I think there there might be a role here. Um, I can't speak to standard essential patents, but I, I can see that there might be a role for um, civil uh, civil um, uh, bodies to kind of work on this um, and perhaps create uh, cohesion where it would not be politically salient to do so at a government level. Mm -hmm. well, I was but, I mean, there's this. like, yes. go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, there's certain data, for example, that that. Uh, certain governments, and and, and, and the, unless I point out that government, not uh, not everyone's going to understand. <laughs> no, well, you'll figure it out anyway. So, so uh, for ch uh, for example, China, uh, China has an unbelievable extensive DNA database of their uh, population, and they did this because of COVID, right? <laughs> so. All that testing, they I mean, do you think they would throw that data away? There's like no way, right? <laughs> right. And 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 there's no way China's ever gonna, you know, uh, 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 share that data with another country, for example. Right. 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 Yeah. So which I guess you know it could be a shame because it could be so it would be a benefit for the population worldwide to know like yes, if they have would. so much information because it's such a big population as well. So they have enough data to come to probably some good conclusion about blood type or, you know, like the impact or the exactly. correlation on different elements, exactly. which could be, exactly. uh, yeah. Yeah, so so one of the big things in, in, in the uh, uh, data economy really is data mining, uh, which basically means you get a whole bunch of data to understand what certain trends are within certain people within certain ranges you know certain economic levels or certain whatever have you right and that data can be used not only for uh mining uh, uh healthcare benefits for example or uh, um for uh, and 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 identify certain trends in certain diseases or, or certain you know uh, uh reactions to drugs for example all right or, or th that information can be used in many other ways that are also also negative too. Right? So you have to understand this is not all positive, right? <laughs> yeah, and one thing that I think we like different expertise should be combined if we were going to have consistent rules, you know, across the world or per region or whatsoever. Like you know, like not only like that, it shouldn't be done only with lawyers. It should be include like economists like you know like engineers and across competency because i believe like you know like digital economy it's not like only for lawyers it's for the whole it, it needs to involve different oh, expertise and different I, expert for different fields. oh definitely completely yeah. agree completely agree <laughs> i remember the first time i met a professor of digital economy and i was like oh an economist 
it, and they were a computer scientist. So absolutely, this is, um, which is my own, it's my own bias. I mean, totally my own bias when they were like, whoa, this sounds fun. Um, it is still very fun. Uh, but it, uh, yeah, it is this absolutely an interdisciplinary space, like for all of this to work and, and be successful. My arts and humanities colleagues say that link between AI and culture is really important too. Yeah, absolutely. And one of my the last topic I wanted us to share a little bit was like if we were going to create a new IP right, you know, we talk about Nicolas favorite trade secret and then copyright and then we can talk about the others. But what should be a new one? Samuel mentioned briefly like the virtual class, the virtual class now. So in some ways, some countries are adapting. Uh, but what should be the new one that, you know, like maybe we should create? as to make sure that um, IP right is protected. I'm, I'm going to say wait and see. I think, <laughs> we, I, no, well, I mean, because we created, the EU created database rights. My understanding is that they haven't actually been that, that useful. Um, and yes. so, you know, as there will absolutely be weaknesses and flaws, and we're already seeing in the courts de being debated in the existing IP system. Um, but I, I would, I, I'd like to think that the existing IP system has enough thought behind it that a lot of these things can be adapted. However, that's a wait and see response. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, um, um. The only other right that I can think about is like algorithmic rights, but to me that an algorithm is functional and therefore should only be protected by a patent, right? But and um, uh, but th there has been some you know some discussion uh, about algorithmic rights, uh, which and and it's a fancy word for saying software rights, but software uh, typically is covered by copyrights and. That that copyright needs to be of that entire software. An algorithmic right is maybe one functional part of that software. I'm sounding like a total nerd, aren't I? I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but but the algorithm should, to me it should not be protected separately. I I think we have sufficient protections on the copyright as well as patents. But but there is some discussion out there uh, about algorithmic rights. And of course, you, you already mentioned the database rights, and I talked about that in Korea also. But um, it's it's very difficult to understand database rights, uh, uh, and it's very difficult to define uh, that particular database unless, it's, it's, unless it has a functional value to it. For example, healthcare data, uh, but not just all healthcare data. Healthcare data related to a certain answer, for example, all right, uh, then that's going to be a very strong database, right? right? Uh, but unless it's so specialized and, and that you can define it in a way and identify it when someone takes it without, you know, properly getting a license to it, uh, it it's not easy to enforce. Oh, we have one Carolyn, question you're muted. from, yeah, sorry about this. I was, uh, so we have one question from Victor, which was, does data mining activities infringe copyright? <laughs> Good question, wow. Victor. That's possibly is my, is the only answer that I can give you unless I understand the, uh, the underlying facts. Uh, data mining really is, 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 identifying trends within like a ton of data that would take people you know tens of years to do because it's a computer you know uh, you could do it within seconds or a minute for example yeah so um, um but to mine uh, to understand what those trends are and to find uh those trends you have to evaluate that data and, and for example read it all right, so so if you can imagine a computer uh, chip acting like a person, reading each set of data, each set of data, and comparing that data to a previous data and saying, hey, there's a trend here for, for example, 55-year-olds who are male who eat a lot of or drink a lot of orange juice, you know, uh, and, and, and that's how it's done. So, so depending on how the original data is, yes, uh, it can be a, a copyright infringement. Thank you. 
Well, I would like to say a big thank you to um, our panelists, Nicola and Samuel, for tonight. Um, and I think we Wonderful. have. Wonderful. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. And I think we have Laurent and uh, Javi who have a few words to say. Well, uh, no, no, it will be uh, Manolo, it will be Professor De Santes, who, Sorry. as per tradition, will close the event. And thank you so much on my personal behalf for your splendid interaction and for all what you brought to our community. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laurent. Pleasure. Thank you, thank you everyone. Line and uh, you know, uh, having you, Caroline, as a moderator has been marvelous. Yeah, you have dealt. Perhaps you didn't realize, but you have dealt with so many dozens of issues. Yeah, uh, starting with the question whether IP enhanced innovation. I I appreciate it very much. Just talking on the spot, the way you brought uh, the Asian flavor into our attention. Uh, the way you brought also the economic perspective, we are more used to the legal perspective. So this was a, this was a, a very, very important uh, uh, change, let's say. The, the way you brought us also, you came descending to specific fields. I remember now hospital information or, or the transfer of medical files or the healthcare data, yeah. Also the relevance you brought issues like data privacy, Data protection legislation, the copyright, yeah, starting with the with the Korean Act, Samuel, yeah, then going to, from to Caroline, uh, if, if I remember, it was Caroline with China, uh, under the understanding that the law is fine, but but it has to be enforced, and the enforcement is what it has to be fine. By the way, we took Samuel the concept of offshoring the copyright infringement, yeah. Uh, you move to trademarks, the inclusion of virtual marks, as you recall well. You, you move, of course, to the secret uh, trade, trade secrets in the new economy, open innovation, the challenge of open data, uh, the possible fact that data can be very easily biased. Yeah? Even, even how COVID has accelerated the arrival of the, of the data economy. You mentioned the standard bodies, you mentioned the, <laughs> the, the calculation of damages, uh, you, you brought what are the opportunities of the, of the near future. You, you, you came also to the, you know, what I, what I mean is that by bringing questions into the encounters, we enlarge the potential of future encounters and we enlarge also the potential of our attendance moving into uh, moving into thinking and reasoning, which is what we expect at the end. Do we need an IP, uh, an I new an IP right in the in the in the new economy? I, mean, I remember, I don't remember which of you say, wait and see. Yeah, IP is it robust enough? I think it was Nicole. Yeah, or other possible rights on the algorithms. What it is evident, and there you, you all have agreed, uh, is that things are changing so quickly. Yeah? The fact that OpenAI is in fourth generation in six months. Yeah? The fact that Amazon knows what you want before you just connect the device. Yeah? So there, Caroline, there, Samuel, and uh, there, Nicole, we are very grateful to you. Welcome to the Encounters family. I have the feeling that you could have moved for hours and hours more, but we have to keep so one hour. There are so many questions that have been just open and closed. Yeah. I would like also to thank very much our, our reporters. This time is Julia Borisova and Ariel Aberdeen. So thanks to you, Julia and Ariel. And you know that I like to emphasize always again and again and again the fact that the Encounters report has become a precious instrument for researchers, for professionals, for academics. And, and this time is already the 30th report. So we are, we are very happy and they are very grateful. So many thanks also to those uh, who have attended the encounter. Uh, we are always very grateful to the followers of the encounters. We appreciate also the fact that after the encounter, when everything is published, we have hundreds of people that listen the recorded copy in the following weeks, in the following months. Uh, and we are convinced that this is our 30th encounter, Javier. And uh, 
and Laurent, we are convinced that the encounters constitute indeed a very, very valuable legacy for the future. And that this, this valuable legacy belongs to all of us, belongs to the intellectual property community. So take care and join, join us again. Join us again for the next uh, encounter. The next encounter will take place, if I took correctly note, on the 28th of November uh, 2023. It will be the encounter number 31, and we'll discuss another hot, hot, hot topic. Yeah, IP and compulsory licensing. We will, as always, we will prepare materials for you. We will prepare um, references for you and we will provide splendid speakers. So thanks very much again for being with us and enjoy the rest of the day. That is just some minutes for Samuel and uh, also just 10 minutes for Nicole, yeah, for Caroline. Yeah, sorry. Enjoy. Thank you so much for inviting us to speak at Thank you. Share today. Thank you. Thanks a lot for being here.